All right, in the last video, we talked about how we can integrate three different or two different types of uncertainty into Insight Maker. We incorporated parameter uncertainty, lack of knowledge first, by saying, well, we might be uncertain about our birth rate. Maybe the birth rate can be as small as 0.2 and maybe as large as 0.5 per capita. So we can say that we just don't know what the birth rate is, and so we're going to make an envelope of all the possible uh, futures where the birth rate is at its low value and the birth rate is at its high value. And we can say, well, the future is gonna look somewhere in between those two, but we don't know exactly what it will look like. So that is a good way to represent parameter uncertainty or just lack of knowledge. And if it's too great, then we can just tell the managers we're working with or we can report in a publication that we just don't have enough information yet and we would need to collect more data in order to learn more and, and be able to more accurately project the future. So that's how we can accommodate parameter uncertainty. We also learned about the compare results tool in Insight Maker, which allows us to uh, to run a bunch of simulations or run two simulations, one at the lower bound, run one at the upper bound, and just overlay them on top of each other. And so we can then see both, uh, we can kind of see the whole envelope of potential futures. So we went over that and then we talked about demographic stochasticity where we incorporated two random number generators, one for the deaths process, the total deaths, and we used a binomial distribution and one for the total births, and we used a Poisson distribution. And that is basically where we ended, and we can go back into that model in Insight Maker. You can see we have a Poisson distribution here for births, and we have a binomial distribution here for deaths. So we got that. Um, and if we simulate, and we, we went over this sensitivity testing tool where we can run multiple simulations and overlay them one on top of one another. And we can basically get a sense for all the possible futures under this stochastic model, because clearly one simulation isn't enough. So we run a whole bunch and uh, we can kind of see what they all look like together. Now, we don't know what the future is going to look like, but it's probably going to be one of these one of these lines. Here's our spaghetti plot. Um, and so we can see that clearly when you start with 10 individuals, the demographic stochasticity has a huge role to play. The, the population could go uh, basically extinct. There's several uh, runs that look like they basically went extinct just due to demographic stochasticity, just due to individual variation, right? inability to predict who's going to live, who's going to die, how many births we're going to have. And then some simulations go way up to like 150. So we have this huge effect of demographic stochasticity, just individual level variation. And just note that in all these simulations, the birth rate is on average 0.4 and the death rate is 0.3. So we should have on average a growing population, but just due to demographic stochasticity, we see that sometimes the population goes extinct. So I think that's an important thing to know. The next thing we can do is move this initial value up to 500 and rerun the sensitivity testing tool. And when we do that, we get something that looks like this. Now, this looks a lot different than our previous run. And we can put them side by side. I should have probably done that before. We can uh, go back to 10 and rerun the sensitivity testing tool. And we can put them side by side and clearly they look very different. Something's going on here. If you start at 10, we have a huge effect of demographic stochasticity. And when we start at a higher abundance of 500, pretty much every, every simulation, if you look at them like a spaghetti plot, they're all looking kind of like exponential growth and they all increase. There's a little variation, but not that much, not, not very much really. The future is pretty certain if we start at 500. The future is pretty certain. The future is very uncertain if we start at 10. So there's a real difference in the, the effect that demographic stochasticity has on 
your population trajectory in the future if you start at a really small abundance versus if you start at a really large abundance. And we will revisit that in the small population paradigm lecture, which is coming up next. So this is a very important, a, a very important concept in conservation biology. All right, so that's where we ended. Now let's let's remove our demographic stochasticity process. Let's just get rid of this Poisson distribution. So we just go back to what we had before, and we get rid of this binomial distribution. So again, it's just muskrats, or whatever species you're working with, times the death rate to get the total number of deaths. Just apply that. And that should be 0.4, that should be 0.3. Let's uh, make sure that we're starting off at a population size of 10 and that we have something that looks like exponential growth. So we're going back to where we were before. And now we're going to integrate environmental stochasticity into our model. So environmental stochasticity is a little different. Environmental stochasticity is saying that the per capita vital rates, these birth rate and death rate, the overall growth rate of the population might be higher some years and lower some years perhaps due to differences in habitat quality among years, more rain one year, less rain the next year. The population itself, this muskrat population here, is getting lucky or unlucky, um, depending on if it's a good year or a bad year. That's environmental stochasticity. So now we're going to, to embrace environmental stochasticity in our models, we're going to use random number generators. But this time, we're going to use normal distributions. And normal distributions are continuous, uh, very flexible distributions that, that are described by a mean and a standard deviation. So what we're going to have to do here is add some more parameters. So let's add some more variables here. I'm going to add four new variables to my workspace, and I'm going to put two near birth rate. It's going to represent the mean and standard deviation of birth rate. And I'm going to put two near the death rate, representing the mean and standard deviation of death rate. So let's just write this out. So this is mean birth rate. I'll write it all out. And this is standard deviation birth rate. And right here, this is the mean death rate. And this is the standard deviation of death rate. All right, and we have to, of course, link these all up. So we got the birth rate, the mean birth rate, and the standard deviation of birth rate are going to be used to define the actual birth rate each year. And same way here, the mean and the standard deviation of death rate are going to be used to define the annual death rate. And each of these parameters, the birth rate and death rate, are going to be stochastic. So we're going to be using a random number generator to define what the birth and death rate are going to be each year. All right, so all we have to do now is click on that equation editor, get rid of what's in there now, and go to the random number functions. And we'll pick the normal distribution. And for the mean, we'll replace that with the mean birth rate. And for the standard deviation, we'll replace that with the standard deviation of the birth rate. So we've defined these things as variables already. So we can just hit Apply. And we'll do the same thing with the death rate. So we're going to pick a normal distribution and define the mean as the mean death rate and the standard deviation as the standard deviation of the mean death rate, of the death rate. So we're going to hit Apply. And we've basically set this model up at this point, but we haven't put values in yet, so we have to have to assign. We're going to keep the mean birth rate at 0.4 and the mean death rate at 0.3. And so now we just have to define the standard deviations. And the standard deviations, I'm just going to make them the same as the, the mean, so to give them quite a bit of variability. So we're going to have a mean of 0.4 and a standard deviation of 0.4 for birth rate, meaning we're going to get values essentially anywhere between 0 and 1, um, or even greater than 1. So um, maybe 1.2, 1.3, we can get at a really high good, good years, and at really bad years, it's going to go down to basically 0. Um, and we'll do the same with death rate. So we'll set that at 0.3. So again, now we're going to have uh, death rates that are very low and potentially some death rates that are very high, almost uh, up towards 1. So um, we've now defined a fully stochastic uh, model that defines the, the 
the birth rate and death rate as variable. Each year it's just a random normal uh, random number that is coming with a mean and a standard deviation that we can define. So let's run this model and see what we get. All right, the first thing I like to do is just get rid of all these parameters that don't change. So we just focus on what we want to focus on here, which is the abundance. So let's hit apply there. And we see that we get uh, something that basically goes extinct. Let's run it again and see what happens. Uh, uh, looks like it kind of goes extinct again. This one doesn't. This one ends up at around 150 and has quite a bit of variability. So again, we can't really say anything from a single run. It doesn't really make sense. So we should use the sensitivity testing tool. And I'll run it just the same way we ran before. Let's run it. All right. Um, there you go. Looks, uh, looks good there. A lot of variability. You can look at and see what these different runs look like. So some of the variability is driven by this one run that gets up to almost 2,000, um, but most of the simulations are, are somewhere within the range of 0 to, to 400. Um, what I'd like you to do is to try different initial abundances and see how, um, how the model changes, how the, the, the total uh, outcome changes when, once you run uh, sensitivity testing with 50 or 100 runs. Does it look different if you start at 10 versus 500? Remember how different it looked like with the demographic stochasticity. So I'd like you to do that again with environmental stochasticity. So please pause the video and answer the question in Top Hat. And when you're ready, then come back to the video. All right. So you should have, at this point, run this environmental stochasticity simulation with a very small value for the initial abundance and a very large value for initial abundance. And um, hopefully, I, I will read all of your responses, and I will know if you, uh, what you think. Did it change? What were the differences? Um, so I won't go over that in this video. But I will say one more thing about environmental stochasticity, and that is this birth rate and death rate are, are, the way we're modeling it now, you could have a really, really low birth rate just randomly from this normal random number generator, and you could have also a really low death rate, or you could have a really high death rate associated with that really low birth rate. Um, and in some cases, we want to go a little bit more sophisticated with our models, because if this really represents habitat quality, if you have a, a year with really high birth rate, you should also maybe have a year with really low death rate because it's a good year. So a good year means high birth rate and low death rate. There's a correlation between the birth rate and the death rate. The way we're modeling it now, there's absolutely no correlation. A good year for birth could also be a bad year for death um, and vice versa. So if we want to make sure that a high birth rate is always associated with a low death rate and a low birth rate is always associated with a high death rate, we can do one better and make this a little more sophisticated and we might make a new variable. And this might be called habitat quality. So I might just name this habitat quality. This is going to be our environmental stochasticity driver. If this value is really low, if it's below zero, then it's below average for both birth rate and death rate. Um, it's going to be a less favorable year. If this value is high or it's above zero, it's going to be a favorable year for both birth and death rates. So um, let's define this as our stochastic random number. So we're going to take a normal distribution and we'll say zero represents an average year. So we'll just say, OK, we'll t take a random number. It's equally likely to be below zero as above zero, 50% chance of being a, a good year, 50% chance of being a bad year. In a standard deviation of one, this is called a standard normal distribution. And so in a really good year, this will be like two. Um, and in a really bad year, this will be like negative two. And so um, this is this. A random number generates every year it's just going to generate a random number and, and it's going to represent whether it's a good year or a bad year. If it's a bad year, then birth rate will be low and death rate will be high.
So let's link both birth rate and death rate to this habitat quality variable. There we go. One and two. And then all we have to do is refactor the birth rate and death rate so that it's these aren't random numbers. We only have one random number. This is the habitat quality. It's representing whether it's a good or bad year. So instead of using a random number generator here, all we're going to do is we're going to take the mean birth rate plus whatever the habitat quality is. If it's a good year, then we add uh, the uh, birth. Uh, we, we have a higher birth rate. So a good year is, in habitat quality is going to be a 1 or a 2. And then we multiply that by the variability in the birth rate. And so that way, we, if it's a good year, we have really high birth rate. If it's a bad year, this habitat quality will be negative, and then the birth rate will be really, really low um, if you multiply it by the standard deviation of birth rate. So this is a way to correlate the birth and death rate. We'll have to do it with death rate as well. So let's get rid of this. We say the mean death rate minus habitat quality times the standard deviation of death rate. So if it's a really good year, right? Habitat quality is like one or two. If it's a really good year, then uh, this will be a lower death rate, right? Because it will subtract the standard deviation times habitat quality. If it's a really bad year, then this will be negative, right? And then we'll add to the death rate. So this way, the birth and death rate are correlated with habitat quality. So this is just a, a more sophisticated way to think about environmental stochasticity. And here we go. And in reality, if we run this, it should um, have a higher extinction risk and a high, and a potentially a higher risk, or I don't know if risk is the right word, but a higher probability of getting really high values as well. Because these are now correlated, um, we're going to see maybe more extreme results because um, a good year here is also a good year here, and a bad year here is a bad year here. So a string of really bad years can be even worse for this population than it was when we treated these as completely uncorrelated. Um, it's OK if you don't completely understand uh, what what I'm doing here, but I hope that you at least can understand that it might make sense in some cases for uh, environmental stochasticity to be defined essentially by a habitat quality variable that, that then links to all the vital rates, because a good year is a good year, regardless of whether you're thinking about birth rate or death rate. Um, you have to decide in your population whether that makes sense or whether it makes sense that these are more uncorrelated. All right, the last thing I want to mention, and I won't uh, implement this in Insight Maker, is that a, an extreme form of environmental stochasticity is called a catastrophe. And a catastrophe means something like a flood or a, a low probability event that causes severe damage to the population. And you can model that in Insight Maker. We could implement a catastrophe by um, you know, implementing a random number that uh, between zero and one, and saying if that if that random number is less than some really small value like zero point oh five or something like that, that means uh, that then that would trigger a a catastrophe, like the abundance is reduced by ninety five percent or something like that, or the death rate goes to ninety nine percent. So you can use an if then else statement to implement a catastrophe with a small probability using a, you know, a random number generator um, to do that. So I may uh, do that in a subsequent video, but I will not subject you to that right now. So I'll end the video now, and uh, that is the end of the stochasticity lecture series.